Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as per the location you are. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the APS webinars. We are happy to continue our first student-led undergraduate seminar series, Pulse, with a panel of a panel on lifetime of a research project navigating the research journey. I am Keshav Samrat Modi, APS student ambassador and a graduate student from ACSIR, CSIR, CSIO Chandigarh, India. And I will be your host for today's broadcast along with Ariana Dalia Vlad, an undergraduate student at Harvard University, USA. I am joined by Cyrus Walter, a graduate student at TU Dormant University, Germany, who will be moderating the question and answer portion of the webinar and Sarah Monk, mem Membership and Volunteer Engagement Coordinator, American Physics Society, who is uh, providing technical support. Thank you all so, uh, all so much for joining us. APS webinar are brought to you as a service of American F uh, Physical Society, connecting you with the expertise of individuals who can offer insight into physics careers educational programs and professional development for students, working physicists and educators. Please change the slides. This is the third webinar in the newly launched series, the physics undergraduate learning and sharing expertise that is for us. Our next broadcast will be on the selecting good mentors, a key to academics and research growth and will take place in January. Please join us for these future broadcast, which will take place over the next several months. And don't forget to sign up for the APS webinars mailing list using the link shown. Next slide, please. This webinar series is organized and is sponsored by the APS ambassadors. The, uh, the student ambassadors program allow students to represent APS at their local institutions to promote APS membership and resources while fostering a community of physics students locally and globally. You can visit the website on the screen to learn more about the program or apply. Next slide, please. APS membership is your connection to the wider physics community through the news, research, and online directory, event, and more. APS offers distinct meetings, newsletters, and online collaboration spaces to help you zero in on the professional working in your field of the study. You can advance uh, your career with the uh, assist to the APS job board webinars, and more resources for physicists. Next slide, please. I'd also like to highlight some of the APS others resources to help students in their career, such as the new physics job board at apsphysicsjobs.com, where you can explore good uh, job opportunities worldwide across different sectors. Next slide, please. And the future of the physics days events for undergraduate at APS March and APS uh, uh, April meeting, where undergraduates can take part in the career workshop and uh, graduate student fairs, professional development, and unique experiences for student presenters. Please visit go.aps.org slash fpd to learn more. Next slide, please. Before formally introducing our speakers, I would like to go uh, over some housekeeping items. Today's presentation features a speaker from multiple research fields in physics with diverse career trajectories in industry and academia. They will be providing information about their backgrounds, exploration of different science fields, 
and how they interact with uh, undergraduate in their lab. After the speakers finish the presentation, the reminder of the program will belong to you for our question and answer session. Because of the number of uh, people attending this webinar, we are only accepting text questions. So if you would like to ask a question, please type it into Q&A panel located on the right, uh, right side of your screen. Please indicate which panelist your question is for if you would like to hear from a specific speaker. You may submit questions through the Q&A panel at any time during the webinar. We will answer all of your questions at the end. We will do our best to cover all the questions at, uh, that you submit. But we want to apologize if, if we are unable to cover anything. Finally, a link to recording of the today's presentation will be emailed to you after the today's event and will be made available on, on the webinar homepage. Please allow four to five days for uh, video upload. We encourage you to complete the survey upon exiting so that APS webinars can improve its ability to provide you with these valuable services. And so with that, let's go started. Please change this slide. Dr. Savana Thais is a associate research scientist in the Data Science Institute with a focus on machine learning. She is interested in complex system modeling and in understanding what types of information is measurable or modelable and what impact designing and performing measurements have on systems and society. This work is informed by her uh, background in high, in high energy particle physics and incorporates traditional scientific experiment design components such as uncertainty qu uh, quantification, experimental uh, blinding and decorrelation, uh, de debiasing methods. Her recent work has focused on geometric deep learning methods to incorporate physics-based inductive bias into ML models. Regulations of uh, emerging technologies, social determination of health, and community education. Dr. Thais is uh, the founder and the research director of Community Insight and Impact. And non-profit organization focused on data-driven community needs assessment for vulnerable populations and effective resource allocation. She is passionate about the impact of science and technology on society and is a strong advocate for improving access to scientific education and literacy, community center technology development, and equitable data practices. She, uh, she was ML knowledge uh, convener for the CMS experiment from 2020 to 2022, currently serves on the executive board of women in machine learning and the executive committee of the APS group on data science and is a founding editor of the Springer AI Eth uh, Ethics Journal. Our next speaker is Dr. Jeevan. He is an associate professor in mechanical uh, engineering department of Indian Institute of Technology, that is IIT Kharagpur. He works on the mathematical modeling of various situations involving solid mechanics and fluid mechanics with bits of electrochemistry. His current focus is on investigating issues of diffusion growth and stress in silicon anode particles of lithium ion batteries, a phenomena that comes under the broad purview of uh, chemomechanics. Earlier, he has worked on fluid uh, flow through narrow deformable confinements, exploring various uh, interfacial phenomena. He has taught undergraduate course on solid mechanics 
fluid mechanics and post graduate courses on elasticity and advanced mechanics of solids in another life he had done his undergraduate and graduate study at iit kharagpur itself and went to, on to do his post doc in applied mathematics at oxford and birmingham united kingdom recently he has uh, taken to youtube to share advice, uh, advice with the student community on various aspect of academic life unfortunately our third speaker dr dennis solden of the university of otha had a family emergency and was not able to join us today but we are confident that the insight from our uh, two speakers will provide a fantastic webinar and uh, guide uh, and guidance for our undergraduate audience now i am handing over uh, the broadcast to cyrus for moderation cyrus Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Cyrus and I will be your moderator today. Please, if you have any questions, let us know and post them in the Q&A so we can address them in between in the, in the webinar. So when you have a question, we will try to incorporate them as fast as possible and at a fitting position in our, in our webinar today. So first of all, thank you, Savannah. Thank you, Jivan, for joining us. It is a pleasure to have you on this very interesting topic, the lifetime of a research project, which is a huge topic on the, it, it, it includes a huge amount of areas that you can follow on. But the first very interesting question is, how do you even decide for a good research question? And what is a good research question? And with that beautiful question, I would like to directly jump into the topic so if one of you has the uh, has the wish to speak first, then please go ahead and do so. And if that's not the case, I would ask Jivan to go first and, and elaborate a little bit on this question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Cyrus. Uh, Savannah, do you uh, want to go first? No, it's fine. You can go. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, thanks, Cyrus. Uh, can we just... Uh, have an idea of what the audience here is primarily. Is it mostly undergraduates? Um, Cyrus, is there any way to know this? We can is it mostly undergraduates we can by make... a show of hands, maybe. Uh, I think well, there's, a, uh, there's a way we, to. We can make yeah, sure we... all the undergraduates raise your hand. So 23, 24, 25, 27. So it reached so almost, almost 50%. Yeah, almost, almost, almost 50%. Okay, okay. so 50% undergraduates, 50% right. graduates. Non-undergraduates. Let's just keep non it that way. Undergraduates, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so, all right. Uh, this is this uh, question, framing the research question, right? Um, Exactly. It depends, so, it depends on the, it really depends on the context because framing the research question from the point of view of an early career researcher who is maybe an assistant professor or maybe a senior postdoc would be quite different from framing the re research question for a senior graduate student or maybe even a beginning graduate student. And certainly it will be quite different in the case of an undergraduate student. So we have to understand the context. So since we have the majority of the students as undergraduates, I'll maybe address that first. Um, so see, when you are an undergraduate and you are going to start working in some lab or maybe even multiple labs, and that's a question we'll go on to later. Um, it is go going to be mostly the case that the question will be posed for you by your research supervisor. I mean, this is usually the case. I mean, um, I have to make this prefatory statement here that uh, there are certain things which should be and which should not be. I will not try to say things as, as they should be. Rather, I'll try to say things as they are, uh, which will be more immediately beneficial to everyone. So as things stand, when an undergraduate student joins a research lab, the question is posed for them. Uh, well, 
it doesn't mean that the student has to mindlessly uh, just pick it up and forge ahead. There is some kind of an intelligent input which is expected of the student, but then that also demands a certain context because uh, see, in this big bad competitive world, the research supervisor also has a limited time. So when he or she or they they are uh, they're supervising a student and they're investing some time, they also probably want to have something in return, most probably in terms of a research paper. But then there is also the uh, associated job of training the future generation. So it's a balance between the two. So I think it is best if the student upfront tells their supervisor what their long-term or the, what their end goal of taking up a research project is. That said, let us assume that the student, the undergraduate student is interested in higher studies. Well, in that case, uh, when they talk with the research supervisor, they should make it clear that uh, how much effort they're willing to put in or how much effort it is possible for them to put in because an undergraduate student has a lot of other responsibilities. Uh, even if they are super efficient, then also there is limited time. They have to do the coursework. They have to participate in certain extracurricular activities to in order to have some kind of a, some semblance of a balanced undergraduate life. And then they have to do this kind of a project work in which, mind you, once you start writing a paper, the big bad world doesn't really recognize whether you are an undergraduate student or a senior professor. If you wish to be recognized as an author of a paper, you have to step into the big shoes and write up the paper as it should be written. So that also demands a lot of time. So keeping all of this into context, uh, keep keeping all of this in mind, you have to frame a research question based on the kind of courses which you have already done, the kind of mathematical abilities that you have. For example, if you're taking up some kind of a theoretical project or what kind of programming skills you have or how comfortable you are with abstract mathematics. Uh, maybe if you want to go into the nitty gritties of linear algebra and its applications in data science and uh, Dr. Thais will be able to tell you better about that. Uh, so you have to understand what is the end goal? What is the background knowledge that you have? And then in discussion with your supervisor, you have to frame the research question. It should not be that just because there happen to be some kind of buzzwords, for example, in, in physics, quantum computing, it sounds great, but do you even have the background to, to get into quantum computing? Do you even know quantum mechanics? So maybe you were a second year undergraduate student and you barely know the basic I mean, the, the absolute rudimentaries of, of quantum mechanics. So does that equip you to take up an actual research project in quantum computing? It is good to be ambitious, but it's also necessary to be realistic. So you have to balance it out a little bit. Um, maybe if you go into condensed matter physics, then uh, taking up something like uh, maybe in soft condensed matter physics, that would be more uh, up your L and he, if, if you're good in maths, maybe, uh, or uh, good in continuum physics, things like that. So I think this, these are the main things which we should keep in mind. I mean, I am, I'm not from the physics background, so uh, Thank I you don't very want to say too many things. This, this was already really, really interesting to look more into what, what areas of skill set you already have to then search for a, and identify a good research question, whether whatever your supervisor also might tell you is appropriate for you and for your, for your skill set. Let's, let's move over to Savannah and give that also perspective from your side, please. So yeah, I, I, I'll target this for undergrads and master's students, um, since that's most of the audience. So, um, I kind of, I, I had, I think five kind of, um, points around this. I think I, I agree with a, a lot of what was just said. It's important, especially at this stage, to have a limited scope to your research project. So, you know, if, if you keep going in academia, you can start to build up much longer term research agendas. Um, 
you know, that might take years or even decades to complete, but as an undergrad or master's student, you are like inherently time limited. So it's important to um, right, think about practically what can be done on the time scale that you have, whether it's just a summer research project, you're, you're working throughout the academic year, you're thinking about a master's thesis, whatever that might be, you have to really yeah, be practical about the time scale. And that's something that, you know, if hopefully your advisor can help you um, figure out as well. Um, and then I also agree with the point, you know, you sh it's best to have some existing knowledge in the um, area of the project you want to work on. So that could be from coursework, that could be from independent study, that could be, um, you know, a previous research experience, anything like that. But typically, you know, jumping into a completely new field um, without at least some coursework or something is going to be quite challenging, especially in this time limited setting. So it's yeah useful to think about your background and if there's a research area you really wanna work in but you haven't learned anything about it, um, I would suggest trying to do like some independent study or coursework first. And sometimes faculty are, you know, okay, faculty are very busy to be uh, fair, but um, you know, sometimes they can suggest materials for you. If you, you know, reach out to someone and say, I'm really interested in your specific research, I'd like to perhaps join your lab um, but I don't have a knowledge basis. Like I do this with students sometimes. Um, I can point them towards resources. You can build up some knowledge before you try to jump into research in an area you're not familiar with. Um, and then, yeah, similarly, it's also important to, you know, be inside the scope of your advisor's research. So you have a lot of freedom there. You can reach out to different faculty members um, to identify who you might want to work with. But, you know, of course, it doesn't make sense to like propose a project to someone that's completely outside of, of their wheelhouse. And so I think this is a really important um, piece of advice that I try to give all undergrads and master's students I talk to. Like if you are reaching out to faculty to try to work with them, you really should know a bit about what their research is in. Like if your goal is, it's okay if you really just want research experience and you would be happy working on a bunch of different things, that's fine. But when you email someone, I think it's important to, you know, demonstrate that you have some idea of what they do and you might, why you might want to work on that specifically. Even if you're sending multiple of those emails to different people, it's good to, you know, think about what the faculty member actually does. Because if I, if, if I don't see something like that in an email, I'm just not going to respond. Um, so yeah, I think third point, be, be inside the scope of, of whoever you want to work with, what their research basis is. Um, and then I think it's also important, so we have like your knowledge base, their knowledge base, and then I think it's also important to think about the broader knowledge base. So is there literature on something related to this um, available to you? Have people thought about a problem like this before? Like, is the methodology to exist and you want to apply it to a new problem? Have people studied this problem before and you want to use a new method? Something like that, because, you know, right, especially in, in general, it's extremely hard to do completely 100% novel research. Um, but especially at the undergrad or master's level where you have this time and, and sort of knowledge limitation, it's good to think about, you know, what no external knowledge exists, especially if there's code bases available. If you're interested, okay, yeah, I do. <laughs> I do computational research. So that's something I'm always looking for. Um, that might not apply to more like lab-based research, but, you know, yeah, existing knowledge base. And then the last point is like, you know, also think about what you want to do. What are your long-term goals? Um, do you want to try to stay in academia? Do you want to have a research career? Are you interested in something more applied? Um, what topics actually interest you? Because like, I promise it's not fun. It, it, you know, it's good. I understand motivation to just get research experience, but it's really not fun to work on something that you hate and that you have no interest in. So um, I think it's important to yeah, consider your own interest as well. Yes, thank you so much. I really love the last point because that's also resonating with me the most because I learned from myself if there's a research topic that I'm following which I'm not 100% passionate about, I can also not give my 100% or 110% to it because sometimes you just have to stay longer. You just have to work yourself through a difficult phase with a lot of issues that you have to face and challenges that you have to overcome. And if you really have this topic where you really are passionate about from the deepest of your heart about it, then you just power through this opportunity of face uh, of through this, uh, through this process of having complicated challenges and you just also you can also from the bottom of your heart 
create new motivation for this issue. I'd just like to go a little bit deeper or like to one more to one of your points. You said reach out to so to one of the professors or to one of one of the teachers and ask them for for some for some literature or for some for some coursework. How would you do that? What mean of communication would you use for that? Would you go knock on the doors? Would you write an email? What's the most appropriate way of doing that? Yeah, I think um either one could work. Um I uh I found people typically reach out to me via email uh, right now. Um, and again, I think what I said about, you know, um, asking about research projects applies here too. Like you want to have some idea that they would have resources to give you, right? If you emailed me and asked me like, oh, I want to learn about condensed matter or quantum computing, like I don't do that. So it, I, I'm not going to answer you. But if you, you know, want to learn about how machine learning applies to physics, and that's something that's often not covered in undergrad or even master's curriculum. Like I would be super happy to talk about that. So make make sure that the person you know has some experience in in what you're asking about, and then um I think show your your um your interest. Like it's I I find these kind of emails like I I like them much better than people who sort of blindly ask to do research because it shows that you are committed in some way to doing good research. You recognize that you maybe don't have all of the skills you need to work on this and you want to build them up. And that's like very um, appealing, I would say, to research advisors because, you know, we want to know that you have some commitment, some real interest um, besides just trying to get, I don't know, resume points or something. Um, so I think it's great to share your passion uh, in this kind of email. You say, you know, something like, I really want to work on this kind of stuff. There's no coursework I can take at my particular university. Can you point me to something? And then um, I would say after that, it's on you to like actually do it and then follow up once you've looked at the materials. And, you know, it's okay to ask questions. Faculty, again, are really busy, so they might not answer you very quickly. But if you do have real questions, um, you know, it's fine to follow up with that, like, hey, I didn't understand this, or could you give me more about this specific point, something like that. Of, of course, um, the moment where they actually write back and you get the material of course it's up to you to follow up and really show that you're passionate and show that you really do the research and learn about these fields and maybe then after you've learned you have created your own basis of knowledge come back and say now i know i know a little bit now i know the basis that you've given me i've written i've written up i gained the knowledge maybe now there's the time of engaging with you on a research project somewhere yeah absolutely yeah. on your fourth point you have you've said that looking around you've mentioned that looking around whether someone has already done such a thing is there literature around in the field i like this i like this point a lot and because it connects to one of one of the other questions i would like to ask on where how should undergraduates maneuver around the fact of existing projects should they pick up a project that someone has has left because of time constraints or because they have they have finished their respective thesis work in, for example, the bachelor's, master's, and their PhDs, and take subparts of them on in their in their undergraduate or graduate research moments when they're when they're looking or when they're communicating, or should they talk with the supervisor and mention they would like to start something new? What are the pros and cons of that aspect as well? Maybe we start first with uh, with Jivon here to to have a little bit of a of a change here. Uh, maybe we alternate. So previously I went first, this time yeah. like Dr. We can also, we can also have Savannah, that's also perfectly fine with me. Yes, <laughs> if Savannah is willing to do that, then we can also go with Savannah first. Sure. Is that fine? Um, the one? Yeah, 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 that's fine. Yeah, right. um, yeah so I think uh, as long as you are genuinely interested in the topic, picking up an existing project from someone's lab can be very advantageous because there's, you know, whatever the previous person, whether it was an undergrad, whether it was a PhD student um, who graduated, whatever, like there's a lot of existing documentation and knowledge. And that's like a big advantage for getting up to speed more quickly than starting something completely new. Um, you're likely to also get a uh, 
Well, yeah, I mean, okay, as an advisor, I love when people want to pick up unfinished projects because I need them to get finished somehow. So you're likely to have some a good amount of engagement from your advisor as well um, because it's something they're already working on. And, and typically, yeah, like you need to finish it. It's not great to just have a research project that someone got like 75% of the way and then it just languishes forever and you never publish uh, about it. So it's your advisor will probably like it. Um, but again, I think it's important that you're actually interested in it. Like um, you don't want to work on something you hate just because it's easier. Um, so, but I do think, yeah, there's a lot of pros to picking up something that's that's already been done. Um, on the other side, you know, there are some pros to, to starting something new. You maybe get to define a bit more uh, your interest area, um, but I, I do think it's a bit more challenging because bandwidth is limited, especially at the faculty level. So again, like I said, in, after the last question, it has to be connected to their research already in some way, or, or they're typically not going to be able to, um, to really advise you um, because they're, yeah, they're very busy. Um, but right, you can build a bit more creativity. That way you can tailor it to your interests a bit more if you start a totally new project. Um, but I do think having some existing knowledge base is still important, even if you're, you know, not picking up a project that your particular advisor was working on in their lab before, um, you know, it's good to say, here are some papers, here's some previous work that I, um, that I've seen and your advisor can help you identify that. Um, but like, you know, right, you don't want to totally start from scratch on something completely random. So it's good to have some kind of knowledge base, even if it's not from within the specific lab you're working with. Yes, lovely. Thank you very much. Over to Jiman for this, for his answer to this question. Uh, thank you, Savannah. So uh, I completely agree with that. Uh, so the worst thing that can happen to an undergraduate student project is that the supervisor loses interest in it. And that can happen for all the reasons that he has very rightly pointed out. So every faculty will have their home directory filled with unfinished projects, which were taken up by initially enthusiastic students and only to never come back to them uh, after it reached about 75% of maturity, probably even less. Um, that said, uh, I would like to add uh, at least one point, which is that uh, since not all undergraduate students uh, who are enthusiastic about research uh, would be interested in higher studies. And that I think is fine because a lot of the skills which are picked up while doing a research project can actually be translated into a number of very, very high skilled, very, very intellectually demanding industrial jobs. So uh, uh, especially uh, if uh, in the process of doing the undergraduate research project, the student picks up some computational skills, uh, that is a tremendous boost, not just to their CV, but in terms of genuine value addition. Uh, so as I said earlier, uh, we want papers as faculty members, but we also recognize the responsibility of teaching and training the next generation of students. I would not personally mind an undergraduate student turning up and telling me upfront that he is not interested in higher studies, but he's willing to give his 100% in a research project. And whatever I can uh, mentor him towards doing, and if that, that happens to uh, bolster his future plans, I don't mind. It is not necessary, absolutely, that it always has to end up with a paper. I'm perfectly happy if, as a result of doing the research project, the student ends up in an intellectually demanding uh, uh, industry job and not just selling detergents. So it's it's also very much about the clear communication upfront that the student makes up their mind ahead of time. What do I want? Where do I want to move, and, and what what implications does that have for for this research project that I want that I want to ask for? And from the beginning on, clearly communicate. Um, there is as... one other thing that I wanted to point out. Uh, yes, please. It may be a little bit unsavory, but uh, since uh, we have a lot of students from India, I think I should make it. Uh, and I I hope nobody minds it because 
as I said, I'll state things as they are, not as they should be. You see, uh, uh, students from India, if they are interested in higher studies, they need to have a, uh, if not a stellar uh, academic record, but at least something which will make them stand out. I mean, just, uh, I'll give you a concrete example. A student maybe who has done an undergraduate at Oxford and is wishing to do his graduate studies at Cambridge, uh, Cambridge in the UK, uh, compared to that, a student from India, maybe from one of the IITs, wishing to do a, a, a PhD at Cambridge, it's not the same thing. I'm sorry to say this. It is what it is. Okay, so in order to stand out from the crowd, he needs to have at least a publication which will make him stand out from so many students who are applying to Cambridge. He has to remember that he's not from Oxford. It is just, a, just one particular example. I'm saying this example because I've been to Oxford. And uh, this, is a, this is a truth. Uh, so they have to keep this in mind. So when they, when they choose a research uh, question, when they choose to work with a certain professor, and if they're absolutely interested in higher studies, particularly if they have some dream institutes in which they would like to go, then this is a practical thing to keep in mind. Just because it takes their fancy and they start doing some kind of a new kind of project in which there is no background material, as Savannah has pointed out, there is nothing to go by. There, is not, I mean, there are no shoulders of giants to stand on. You will be, I mean, you will you'll, you'll absolutely flounder. It happens to the best of us. If you start on a new area, you will flounder. That is the way things are. So as an undergraduate student, you'll flounder even more. So if you, if you start as compared to that, if you start on something which, on which already some background material exists, maybe in the same lab, people have worked on a certain area. It has reached a certain level of maturity. And you, even if you do a little bit of an incremental work, Maybe you do not have a stellar publication, but you do have a publication that actually bolsters your career. I, I don't want to sound like a careerist, but I mean, as I said, if you want to reach a certain stage where you actually want to contribute to science and engineering science, um, you have to first go through the gates. So. Yes, thank you very much. This also this is this is great insight for for many people around the globe, and also it, it gives good of, good perspective of even if you're not from India, how things are on a different side of the world, and it gives you a sense of right. internationality and learning that different different systems work differently. Also, that that's the same for for me in Germany. Things in Germany also work very differently um, in comparison for the U.S. And sometimes I'm wondering why certain procedures are the way they are in in the U.S. And then I always remind myself that the systems are working differently. So thank you very much for that insight. I'd like to move on to one of the questions from the Q&A, also to show our participants that we very much do take them to, to account because one of the second question in the Q&A list very much fits in my opinion. And it reads, can the guest explain about the case of a person like who have who has a publication in a Q1 journal and he, he or she wants to do a PhD without a master's degree? Is that a problem for a future career? And since we are alternating, then it would be Jivan's task to answer first. Uh, sorry, I'm looking at the list of the questions here. Uh, where is it? It's, oh, it's sorry, the second. Sorry, sorry. Repeat the it's, question. Uh, I, can, I can read the question again, if, if you want. Sorry. It's, it's, can the guests please explain about the case of a person who has a publication in a Q1 journal and he or she wants to do a PhD without a master's degree. Is that a problem for the future career? So uh, this person has a journal publication from their undergraduate studies? Yes, I would interpret it this way. So they have a, they have a publication in from the undergraduate studies, but they don't have a master's degree, but they would so, right. like to enroll into a PhD program. Right. Uh, I'm not sure about Europe, but the way that it works in the United States is that uh, you join a graduate program as after completing your undergraduate. Uh, I think this is common knowledge, but I mean, uh, uh, 
So, so that's the way it is uh, in the United States that uh, you join a graduate program after completing your undergraduate uh, studies. And graduate program means uh, it is it is a program which leads finally to a PhD. So you don't do an explicit master's program in between. Although you can do that, but getting a scholarship for that is not that easy. It is relatively, I mean, more common for people to get scholarships um, for a program which ultimately leads to a PhD program. I'm not so sure about Europe, so maybe uh, Cyrus, you can answer that. I, I can indeed answer that for Europe. So in Europe, at least from what I've heard in Germany and so in many other countries, it's very much usual to first do your master's. So for me, as I am a graduate student right now, I would not be able to apply for after my undergraduates to a PhD position. They would require a master's first before I can enroll into a, into a PhD position here, especially because the, the US system would work in such a way that first you have, have courses that would equal a master's degree most of the time in the PhD programs. And then you then you move on to independent research in your PhD in the PhD PhD phase of this program, and and in Germany the PhD program is what you are paid for, so you're then employed by the university or by the respective research body, and by that also do all kinds of stuff like paying taxes and being being fully not any not anymore you count as a student to the university, but you have a full salary in that sense. So that's the system how it works in Germany and many other countries in Europe. So that, that is where the US and, and Europe are in in some sense different in, in structure. Savannah, would you like to add something to that question? Um, sure, I, I yeah, I can add a bit. So my whole career has been in the US. So uh, like was said here, you um, go typically uh, right into a PhD program after an undergrad degree. Um, and you do coursework at the beginning of your PhD that's equivalent to like the European master's. Um, that is true. Uh, however, I, I think master's degrees can still be useful, um, particularly if you're not from the US uh, and you're applying to US schools. I know a lot of international students who did master's first before, um, uh, before applying to PhDs, particularly if you're applying to extremely competitive PhD programs. It can be helpful to do that. You can get more research out. Um, you you learn a bit more. You build more connections. You find more people who can write you letters. Um, so I know um, quite a few international students, but also uh, even American students who have done masters between uh, undergrad and PhD. Particularly if you um, want to change scope a bit from what you focused on in your undergrad or you just feel that you're not totally ready for PhD level coursework, PhD level research. Um, one of my best friends did a um, master's degree um, before his PhD because he wanted uh, to get into uh, more competitive PhD programs that he wasn't accepted to um, right out of undergrad. Um, so it can be helpful to bolster. I do want to acknowledge though that, I mean, it's, yeah, financially it is, a, sometimes quite difficult to do a master's degree um, because they're typically not paid. There are some schools have scholarships um, uh, and you can certainly target those ones um, for a master's uh, degree, particularly in, in STEM fields. I feel like it's, it's more common than humanities or something that there will be scholarships available for master's programs. Um, but of course it's not doable for everyone. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's my thoughts. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. I believe we have also also explained plenty on that question. I would dive into another question from the audience, which is: What are the emerging questions of research in the experimental high energy physics? So I believe that that goes over to Savannah, targeting your field. So there, <laughs> apparently, someone is very much interested in your field and would like to know what is what are the burning questions right now? What is like the, the hot topic? Um. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Uh, sort of a hard question. There's several things. So I think the same questions that we've had for the last 50 years are still the kind of core motivating question. So this is things like, what is dark matter? Is dark matter a particle? Why is the Higgs, one, why does the Higgs have the specific mass that it does? Why is the top quark heavier uh, than all the other quarks? Why is there more matter than antimatter in the universe? Um, 
these are sort of the fundamental questions I would say that drive uh, high energy particle physics research. They're not really research questions, <laughs> however, that you can sort of address as an individual researcher or even as a lab. They're very, very large scope questions. So typically, you know, what you do if you work on high energy particle physics um, is you pick either a precision measurement you want to do. So um, this often right now is focused on Higgs measurements or neutrino measurements. So you want to measure the mass of the Higgs more precisely, the coupling of the Higgs to some other particle more precisely. You want to measure, we know that neutrinos seem to have a very small mass. They have this flavor oscillation behavior. So maybe you want to measure something we already know about, but more precisely, because that tells us, you know, whether or not it completely adheres to the standard model. And the other approach is looking for something new. So, you know, we know that there are all these unanswered questions, so we can come up with theorists, particularly mostly, come up with all kinds of extensions to the standard model. Um, so something that was extremely popular in the past was supersymmetry. Um, there is still a lot of people working on supersymmetry. Personally, I would probably not work on supersymmetry right now, but it's certainly still a popular area of research, but there's lots of different new physics searches you can do. So you pick a particular extension to the standard model that you like, and you try to look for evidence of that model. Those are sort of the two main directions uh, in fundamental high energy experiment research. What I do is um, computation focused. So I did a, both a new physics search and a precision measurement in my PhD. I did not enjoy either of them personally. I'm much more interested in, in machine learning and like kind of fundamental modeling stuff. Um, and that is a emerging area of research, I would say in high energy experimental physics. Um, so this is things like, I mean, we have huge, huge data sets that need to be processed. Um, there's a lot of ways to apply machine learning there. There's a lot of ways to imply, apply physics uh, motivated machine learning. And we don't know the best way to do that. So it's very interesting place to research, in my opinion. <laughs> it's what I do, so obviously I think it's interesting. Um, it, however, I think it's a bit hard to do a PhD in the US, at least, totally focused on that because it's not traditional physics research still. Um, there are certainly labs, um, my lab, for example, <laughs> that focuses a lot on that, but doing that as your whole PhD is a bit tricky in the US. I think it's it's a bit easier in Europe. Um, right now and and things are changing but um you would probably still have to do some kind of precision measurement or search if you want to do a phd in physics but you could also do a phd in stats or computer science if there are people there are a few people like i i mentor computer science phd students so there are a few people who do that if you're interested in really the intersection of computer science and physics that's that's doable as well but typically not in a physics department thank you very much I can also echo that in Europe, currently, machine learning goes through the roof. And at every university, there are institutes for machine learning and AI jumping out of jumping out of the floor like, like at any place. At my university, it's the Lamar Institute that has just recently been opened, where they where they intertwine classical computer science with other with other, you know, projects or other parts of of, of studies, like for example, physics. And that that currently is in, is going in Europe absolutely crazy. It's it's really interesting to see, um, and that is really much really much a motivation, also a path that Europe is taking right now. And thank you very much for this really for this really nice answer, also including many many branches of of where you can do research on. I want to take one more question from the audience before we switch a little bit to the set of the topic, and that would be a more critical answer, uh, critical question or more situation on how and, and your advice and how you would react which is there's no advisor or professor doing research in my col in my college and i have reached out to to other people what should i do what is the next part what should i do if that hasn't worked uh may i take that question yes please um uh, can you please name the person um that person is called afnan sayed uh I'm assuming he's from my side of the world. Um, Could be. Okay. Uh, so this is a common scenario here in many universities uh, in India, as well as 
in the SARC countries. Um, it is unfortunate. And uh, students who were a little bit unfortunate uh, in not going to grade schools as a result of that, not going to a good, maybe a prep school or an undergraduate school, and then uh, ending up in this kind of a scenario, uh, there is still hope, but it is a bit of a tortuous path. I mean, again, I don't want to sugarcoat it. Um, so usually what I have seen people doing it, the way that people do it is uh, it's kind of a ratchet up in your career. You, you, if it is not there in your university, what's the point of crying over it? It is not there. It is a fact of life. So the best that you can do is to score as high as possible academically in your existing university because there will be courses there. There may not be a research professor there, but you can, there is no one stopping you from doing excellently well in your academics. Let that be a stepping stone for you into going into a slightly higher uh, institute where there will be a little bit more research. And then maybe from there on, you can launch yourself into a proper research university. I know it is, it, it, it'll take time. There is, there are no two ways about it. When you have to ratchet up one level at a time, it will take time, but it has been done. Uh, I have, I have seen myself firsthand people doing this and ultimately they have managed to carve out a great career not just a great career, relatively speaking, but a great career in an absolute sense. So it is very much possible. But then, uh, I mean, you cannot, you cannot feel like a victim all throughout the three or four years of your undergraduate and then say, oh, this is my lot. What am I to do? What am I to do? No, is this is your lot, accept it, and then ratchet up. I mean, there is simply no other way or going about it. I mean, there is no, I mean, royal shortcut to uh, to get out of your situation. And this can be done. This absolutely can be done. I, I actually know people uh, who have done this. I mean, I, I can actually name those guys, but I do not have the permission from them because this is an offhand question. Otherwise I would have taken permission from them and I would have told you their life story. Thank you very much for this for this answer. This is really interesting, and indeed, it's it's very well the truth of of it's very much better to say the truth and not sugarcoat it here, and also give give an honest view to to our audience. I'd like to move a little bit the facade, moving a little bit away from the from the part of whether whether a person we have already moved away very far from the part of whether a person <laughs> should. should take on an, an existing topic or, or start a new topic, which is good because we see that we're very much, that the audience is very much engaged. We have so many questions that we will not never be able to answer all of them. We will do our very best to choose, uh, to choose many of them. However, now I'd like to switch a little bit more to the funding perspective from, from, from a bigger perspective of a research project. So if funding changes, how does that change the trajectory of such a project and what impact can that have also for the single more smaller undergraduate or graduate student that might be involved with that project. And I lost well, track who of you would be first. Savannah, do you want to go first? Yes, maybe Savannah goes first. Sure. So sorry, the question is about if funding shifts, how does that impact? Exactly. So sometimes sometimes funding shifts or funding periods end or, or you know you know new projects start and there's there's new funding coming in or funding is cut from certain outside sources and that of course impacts the whole group of re of researchers of course people who are employed directly by by the group much more than you know one undergraduate researcher but they might also be impacted by that from different facets so how would you how would you see that how would that impact such a such a research project yeah so <laughs> A, yeah, unfortunate question. Um, so I guess the biggest thing would be that if there's a major shift in funding in terms of cuts, uh, 
you lose funding for a project, something is not renewed, whatever. Um, the first thing that would be cut because it's um, uh, not essential in, in some way is unfortunately undergrad researchers if I'm paying them. Uh, so I might no longer be able to pay undergrad researchers. Um, it's much harder to cut funding for a PhD student who's like halfway through their program and that is their, you know, main source of income and they, they won't be able to stay in the program um, otherwise. Um, but in terms of project shifting, um, if I get new funding for a project, uh, I typically don't make everyone change what they're doing. Like ideally, if my lab is running the way that I, I'm hoping for it to run, if I get new funding, I'm going to hire someone else in the lab. Um, and for undergrads, you know, because they're less focused potentially on a specific project, they're more interested in exploring, you know, I might say, okay, we have this new PhD student, we have this new postdoc coming in, they're going to be working on this. If you're interested in learning about that, like, you know, let's talk about it. Maybe you can work on something related to that too. Um, if it's really exclusive funding and I no longer have funding for one project, I only have funding for a different project, then that's sort of how it is. And, and you know, I would have to have a conversation with the students and be like, you know, I, whenever you've done good work, like if you're interested in continuing, here's what I can offer you. This is what I have funding for. Um, I think with undergrads, if you're doing non-paid research work, which again, I think is, it's really not ideal. It's a huge financial privilege to be able to do something like that. But typically if I'm working with undergrads and, and I'm not paying them from my lab, um, if I lose funding on something, they don't have to change what they're doing because I'm not paying them from sponsored funds anyway, so they can keep working on their particular project. They're pretty isolated from the funding considerations. Um, but I guess, yeah, it really depends on the situation, if it's like a cut or if it's just additional funding coming in. Um, yeah, it sort of depends on that. Yes, thank you very much. I, I definitely see that perspective. It, it's very unfortunate, but then, you know, if, if you're paying undergraduate researchers, they are the least, you know, elementary, they're elementarily important for the, for the racist group then. Yes, I, I, I see that definitely. It's it's a sad it's a sad truth, but of course, yes. So so one has to be aware of, you know, in, in case those cuts come in. Of course, if there's increase in budget, that's always great. I mean, who wouldn't like to employ more people and do more research, right? So but if there unfortunately sometimes there are cuts, and then of course one has to be aware of that this could happen. I believe it's also very important that there's clear communication then going on, that it's not just, no, we're just cutting you because, you know, there's important reasoning behind it. So over to Jivan uh, for your perspective of, on this question. Uh, I think uh, this uh, this precariousness uh, with funding, uh, it is, uh, I have I've heard horror stories from the US. <laughs> so let's just put it that way. Uh, so one of our students, uh, he joined uh, a graduate program in a, in a really, really famous university, the kind of famous universities which you hear about in movies. Uh, so I'm not taking names here. Um, so uh, he, 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 uh, uh, so at the, at the graduate level, as a PhD student, after maybe one year of work, he had to leave the program, not for any fault of his. I mean, he ended up, uh, he had a, had a beautiful landing elsewhere. Uh, and and he's very happily and much more, I mean, uh, financially well off than he would have been as a graduate student. But well, his higher uh, higher studies ambitions didn't pan out as he had hoped to. Um, but that is for the graduate students. Uh, for the undergraduate students, I think uh, what uh, Savannah mentioned is that if they are unpaid to begin with, it really doesn't matter. I mean. Let them continue. In fact, it would mat matter the least to them. That is the logical conclusion. Uh, however, here in India, we have a slightly different system. Uh, the We have the system of institute scholars. Uh, so they are paid for by the government. I don't have to worry about their funding. Uh, so they're paid for five years. Uh, and that's that. I mean, 
I don't have to collect, I mean, find funding for them. We do have a separate system where we find funding and then we sponsor our own students. That's a completely separate system. But then I would know when my money runs out. So if I don't have sufficient time, my institute itself would not allow me to hire a new student. So there are checks and balances in place. And uh, regarding undergraduate students, uh, I mean, I have not heard of any lab who uh, or a, or a uh, principal in investigator, a PI, who has hired an undergraduate student from his own institute and has paid them. I mean, this doesn't, that system doesn't exist. So if they, if they, I mean, if they get, get an opportunity to work uh, in a particular group, it's great. However, we have the system of internships. So if some student comes from another institute over the summer, then we have the system of, uh, of a paid summer internship. But for students of our institute, and I have actually my own student among the audience, I am not paying him. <laughs> so I might get an email from him tonight. Start paying me. I, I have. I hope we don't create any costs for you through through the seminar. That oh, that, yeah. that will be least of our interest, of course. Let's go. Let Let's move again to the audience questions because there are so many of them, and there. So we really want to engage with the audience. Let me read one out. That is directly to Jivan. So continuing to, to focus on you, I hope you don't mind that too much. It's, do you have any recommendations for government or private funding agencies slash schemes that a faculty member can approach to uh, for purely undergraduate projects in physics in India? That is projects or research and lab where graduate or doctoral level research is not being conducted. It's a very focused uh... question. See, uh, for physics, I do not know, but for engineering, which is my domain, to the best of my knowledge, there is nothing which exists specifically for undergraduate thing. We have a number of funding bodies, which, uh, I mean, which fund our projects. And as part of that projects, we can hire research fellows uh, who can then go on to do their masters and PhDs also formally with us uh, as time evolves. And as part of that large project, we can hire uh, undergraduate students to work with us. There is also a provision from certain funding bodies to fund summer interns. But uh, specifically to answer that question, my answer is I do not know. Sorry. For physics, I simply do not know. Because for science, uh, sometimes there are some special funding kind of things because it's basic research and if the government doesn't do it who else will so those kinds of things but uh since i'm not in physics i do not know thank you very much well one question that i found is especially interesting is is questioning the whole discussion so why are why are higher studies even important why do we need higher studies in the first place why can't we just practice research, research through industry and going into an R&D department of, of a certain company, for example. So where, come again? Is that directed at me? That That is the direct, probably we talk with Savannah, we start with Savannah and then we come to yeah. you because you just had, yeah. Um, yeah. but it's, it's a very you. interesting question because it, it, it completely, completely questions the whole setting and the whole base question of this, of this, uh, of the seminar. So over to Savannah. Um, sure. So, uh, I mean, I suppose it depends on what kind of research you want to do. Um, but in very fundamental scientific research, either in physics, at least my area of physics, which was a, again, high energy uh, experiment, um, or if you really want to do machine learning research and not, uh, just applied stuff, Frankly, like you just don't have the knowledge base to do it out of an undergrad degree. Um, I, I think there's a lot of complex, uh, specific subject matter that you need to uh, know, a, a knowledge foundation that you need to have to do a basic research in, um, in highly technical scientific fields. Um, and a company is not going to teach you that stuff. Like they're not paying you to do coursework for two years. They are paying you to produce something of value for the company. So you're, I just don't 
I have never seen someone go out of undergrad and ever get to really do research, like fundamental research that's driven by you in industry. If you are happy to work in an industrial lab without, you know, sort of guiding your own research questions with sort of being more of a lab tech type position, like, yes, you can do that in industry. Um, but if you want to do real basic research, it, it's uh, fairly impossible, both from a, you know, knowledge basis viewpoint. And also, you know, if companies have the option to hire someone with a PhD or someone with an undergrad degree, they're going to hire someone with a PhD to do research. Like it's just, and they're unfortunately, there's sort of a sur surplus of technical PhDs in the world because there's extremely limited academic jobs. So most people who do PhDs are going to end up going into industry. So it just, yeah, it, it just doesn't seem very feasible to me. Um, yeah, you, you won't, uh, I also don't think you develop very deep research skills necessarily as an undergrad because you have so many other things to do. You're doing coursework, you're doing, you know, hopefully having some fun, right? Having some undergraduate experience, like having a social life, um, doing, uh, potentially exploring multiple subjects at the same time, like you're doing extracurriculars, all of these things. So um, I just, yeah, I don't think you you usually build a foundation to do real deep research um, without doing a research focused degree. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting topic. I give it to Jivan for, for his answer. Uh, yeah. So I'll uh, I'll interpret that question more on the existential front, meaning probably the student wants to ask why even have PhDs in the world. Uh, <laughs> so I mean it's a it's a valid question. One can always question. I mean, what's the point of academia? I mean, if it is the industries which are building everything, and we are just publishing papers. Why have PhDs at all? I mean, what 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 will finding the Higgs boson fetch us? It is not going to make my toothpaste stronger. So, well, <laughs> uh, try to think of it this way. So, whoever has thoughts like this, that back in the day when people were just uh, having fun with number theory. It was just for the sake of it, right? I mean, maybe there was a rich king who funded Euler. I don't know the name. I don't know the history. I mean, maybe he got some uh, patronship from some king, and then he did some number theory, and then some uh, poor mathematician continued that work, and then they continued doing that work. But then, lo and behold, in the 20th century, uh, the number theory, it pitches into the whole idea of how ATMs work how your pin code works. I mean, how, how do you think the basic fundamentals of that work? So if you keep on backtracking, it goes back to number theory. So that is, I mean, if, if your question was uh, as broad as that, maybe I think this concrete example uh, answers your question. So we never know what kind of basic research will ultimately lead to what kind of concrete development in the in the product producing industries and there are a number of things which people have come up with as a as a result of seemingly useless research uh, and not just in industry for uh, take the example of the medical field 100 years ago i mean not 100 years maybe 150 years ago you did not even have x rays and now you have such fantastic uh, uh, medical imaging available. So much basic physics goes into medical imaging. So much, I mean, fundamental mathematics goes into uh, medical imaging. Uh, I don't know if you have heard of this, uh, something called Radon Transform. So it was like an absolutely obscure mathematical technique, but which finds direct use in one of the, uh, one of the most often used medical imaging devices. So you never know what is actually going to come up. The person who studied, who, who found out the red and transform, he never had medical imaging in his mind. So that's how basic research works. Uh, that's how research works. So 
I mean, uh, I don't know how else to answer that kind of, if, if it was at that existential level, I don't know how else to answer that question. This is my answer. That, that, is, that is perfectly fine. Thank you very much. Um, and in the in the meantime, I, I used the time to also on, on, on one eye check where Leonard Euler got his funding from, which is to uh, to academies of sciences from two different countries in the in the middle or in generally in Europe, which have been paid by the respective emperor indeed. So he, he got his funding <laughs> from the respective emperors. Okay, but back back to the original topic. Let's move on with another question. We have a lot of questions in the in the Q and A, which are focused on one specific situation. I would like to, for the for the sake of asking questions, who are who are applicable to to the uh, the whole audience, ask more questions that are not focused on one specific situation. Which one of them is? What is the minimum academic maturity level that one has to achieve to actually properly do research? So the sen the moment where it actually makes sense from which it makes sense to do real research on real research or to move into a move into a research project. And since Savannah has just started, I would take Jeevan to go first. All right. Um, yeah, these are my favorite questions. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, the time is never right in your head for any undergraduate student if you think that maybe one more semester, I will gain more knowledge and uh, uh, I'll then start working on something. Uh, one semester later, you will, you will you'll gain more knowledge, but you'll also understand how little you know. So you'll have even less confidence to start. So my suggestion is that just start. I mean, be prepared to appear like a fool to yourself. When you read a research paper, you won't even understand two sentences from the abstract itself. And that is completely fine. So nobody expects you to do that. But if you don't start, it is never going to start. So the way that I start off the students who come to me to do their undergraduate research project is that I, I tell them that if the background physics is a little bit difficult, I tell them, don't worry about it. Just read it like a story. And then you know a little bit of maths. Uh, because I do kind of theoretical engineering science, you know a little bit of maths, you know how to solve differential equations. And in this paper, look, there are differential equations. Look, there are boundary conditions, there are initial conditions. So why don't you just go and do the, the intermediate steps which are not shown in the, in the paper? Because it's always substituting this and that, and then we get obviously this equation. So you fill in that obviously thing. And by the time you have worked through the algebra and the differential equations, you will have a fairly good idea of the flow of the paper, even if you don't understand the background physics much. And then you go back and read the abstract, maybe instead of two lines, you will understand four lines now. And then you iterate through it. And then you come and talk with me. So the more you persist a little bit uh, with, the, with the details, and together with having a little faith with yourself and your research supervisor and proceed, I think things do fall into place. Never completely, but they do fall into place. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then we'll be over to Savannah for, for her side from the question. Sure. Um, so yeah, I think, I, I'm not sure what is meant by real research, I guess, but I think it's, useful to you know start as early as you feel um comfortable engaging i i agree with the point that um it's it can be intimidating um and i and that it's different for different people like personally i uh i started research uh the summer after my second year of undergrad um, I know people who started earlier than I did, and and I was like way too intimidated to try to talk to professors, um, to feel like I didn't feel like I knew anything, so uh, I didn't, and it it was fine. Uh, it was also fine for people who started earlier than I did. Um, uh, so you know, I I think respecting your own comfort level is reasonable. Like it's not great to torture yourself to try to do research before you're ready, but um, you know, I think there's value to be gained from from engaging with research at, at any stage. And I've certainly worked with 
students as early. Actually, I've worked with high schoolers in my lab, um, uh, not very often, but sometimes. Um, and I think it can be useful even to see how research is done, even if you're not really contributing to the lab, you're not maybe doing novel research that's ultimately going to be published, you're just replicating things that have been done before. Um, even just going to research meetings, like seeing how a lab works, how a lab runs, can be super useful. And I worked with an undergrad student this summer who, that was really her whole goal. Like she wanted to understand more about how research was done at the intersection of like machine learning and societal impact. Um, she went to a primarily undergrad uh, university or an entirely undergrad university. So there weren't many like faculty doing that kind of, any faculty uh, doing that kind of research. And so we didn't end up publishing anything uh, from our work together, but she, at least what she told me is she found it very valuable just to see how research is done, how people come up with questions, how they approach questions, how they interpret results, how they do literature review. Um, and so, yeah, even if you're not doing super de uh, in-depth, uh, self-motivated research is still useful, I think, to engage with the process. Yes, I absolutely agree. And one, one to set from my side is also, you know, looking back to when I was an undergraduate and I didn't do research at all until I actually, actually also the, the summer after my second year, I started to do, to do research because it just fitted in. I just finished my course in quantum mechanics, completely different field than what I, of, of what I was working on that back then. Um, which is what I'm working on now. So, and the idea is, and my idea was back then, I, I definitely have to choose a field of research and I have to forever stay in that field. So it's like the final decision ever. And it's not. And looking back, probably the most useful thing I could have done was just asking, maybe, you know, my tutor or the person that's, you know, that I see, not who's not the professor, but still working with a professor, maybe like a PhD student or so, and just shadowing them for a day or two, seeing how their life is. Because the life, for example, as an astrophysicist, and for my, for my, in my case, who's coding his own AI in his master thesis, is it, insanely often just sitting there and, and researching stuff and Googling yourself through papers. And it, Often you write three lines of code and something is not working and you're Googling your way through the issues and 90% of the day, you're just problem fixing. So it's, it's really a lot about problem fixing, but this is, this is often how physics research is. So you start something, you encounter issues, you try to solve the problems, you try to, to make your, your setup work also in solid state physics. Often it is like this, something is not working. And if I would have known that this is how, how the research looks, I would have been much more, much less intimidated when I was starting my research first. And I and, and I would have known how to how to engage with these issues because when I when I saw issues I was how am I going to solve them, and if I would have known also the PhD students do nothing else but just googling all day, then I would have been much less intimidated to just say I've googled this three times I didn't find the solution can you help me please, that that would have that was you know looking back that's one of the best advices I can give definitely on this field so absolutely echoing your thoughts about how this how how to approach and when to approach people. One question that is connecting also very much to that and also to what Jivan said is about that, that it is just very tedious work that you have, you know, when you're starting, you have to look through papers, you have to learn. And in the beginning, you will face many issues where you have no idea. And there's one question that also, that's also facing that, uh, you know, that's also um, addressing that issue, which is, and, and that's actually to Jivan, but I would say that's, that both of you would uh, it would be marvelous if both of you would would give a would give a viewpoint to that which is i want to know how we can explore research, a research topic whether should or should uh, whether i should choose or choose one or should not choose one and other topics in a more efficient manner as it becomes very tedious and hard stuff to do it when we have all of these uh, all of, a lot of things to do as an undergraduate with undergraduate courses and we uh, and also we have not that much knowledge as, to, as we have just completed our intermediate schooling. And um, since, yes, yeah, if you want to yeah, go ahead. Right. So um, I know uh, it can seem uh, a little bit intimidating to make this choice when, uh, I mean, the, the 
the problem is that you do not know about anything and you are supposed to make a choice. Uh, so what do you do? I think uh, what has worked well for a lot of people is not to think of it in terms of the research area, rather in a more, uh, I would say, practical sense. See, you would be an undergraduate student at a certain university or an institute, and you would be, uh, you would have already done a few courses with certain professors. Now, when you are beginning, it is extremely important not to be put off by research, by this whole idea of research itself. That kind of a thing may happen if you start working with a supervisor who may be absolutely famous and big and whatnot, but he doesn't care about you. And uh, he just uses you like another like a puny cog in his entire machinery of, of his entire empire. So that will that is going to put you off. Rather, if you if you approach a professor who seems kind of friendly and is willing to give you the, the modicum of time that is necessary to understand a few things here and there, and at the same time, have an open mind about the research area in the sense that you are not getting married to it. So people do get into arranged marriages and learn to fall in love. So why not in research? Basically, you do not know anything. You do not know anything. So start doing something, get the idea of what research is about. I mean, let the research area be whatever, doesn't matter. I have changed my research area so many times. So many times, the kind of thing that I started doing as an undergraduate after my second year, I thought that was going to be my research area. I even proclaimed to my students that, uh, to, to my friends that uh, I am never going to touch fluid mechanics and heat transfer. And lo and behold, I did my PhD in fluid mechanics. And then I did my postdoc in solid mechanics. And then I did my second postdoc in fluid mechanics. And then I became a faculty doing a two-pronged research in fluid mechanics and solid mechanics. So no, no research experience goes wasted. And uh, so there is no point wasting time in picking out a research area when you do not have any idea of research and when you don't have any idea of research area, just start with someone who will actually be a genuine mentor to you and in terms of the research area, just think of it like a research training more than the actual contents of the research. I think the by the time you gain a little bit of a maturity, you will know what to do. Thank you very much. Over to Savannah. Um, yeah, so I, I, I definitely agree with that. I think just learning what research is like is, is valuable. Um, the thing I would say is try to go to seminars um uh i've i found that super helpful um uh, they i feel like people prepare seminars typically for like phd level um so you know you might not understand everything that the seminar speaker is talking about but especially department seminars or if you know you're interested in a particular you might be interested in a particular subfield like astro particle physics condensed matter whatever there's often like specific seminars for those subjects as well. And so going to those can be a good way to see lots of different kinds of research. It's in a nice, uh, well, <laughs> if they're good speakers, it's in a nice kind of uh, presentation format that, uh, you know, is not too in the nitty gritty details, gives you an overview. Um, so I found those really helpful. It's actually how I realized that I didn't want to be a physicist and I wanted to, um, do more machine learning focused research. Um, in grad school, I went to a ton of seminars from different departments, even like I mostly didn't go to the physics seminars. Actually, I went to computer science seminars. I went to um, the school of public policy seminars, like, but regardless, I think seminars are great. Um, and then also blogs. Uh, unfortunately, I don't <laughs> know many good physics ones because I don't really focus on that. But certainly for like machine learning, there is really great um, kind of blogs. I think it's pretty common practice now, even that people who publish really um, meaty research papers will also do an accompanying blog post that breaks it down in a more accessible way. Um, and I know there are, at least from 
back when I was more focused on particle physics, there were particle physics um, blogs like this. So trying to find like non um, academic paper resources can also be helpful because you don't have to have so much knowledge, so much intensity to like engage with them and you can get a bit of a better sense of how these things work. Thank you so much. I just barely take one one of these phrases out, which is engage and and go ahead and move ahead. And this is going to be the last question of of this Q and A session. It has been a huge honor to have both of you. That it has been a marvelous time. I really enjoyed the the last ninety almost ninety minutes. It it was it were marvelous questions. I learned myself many 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 aspects. I also thank you very much to the audience for being so engaged. And again, also, please, the audience, feel free to thank our speakers. I will hand over to Ariana, who is one of our chairs of our program, of our seminar series for concluding this event. Thank you very much again to Savannah. Thank you very much to Jivan. Over to you, Ariana. Like Cyrus said, this is all the time we have for the webinar. We hope that we covered most of your questions and we really apologize if we did not get to it. We encourage you to follow up by sending an email to webinar.aps.org um, and we'll forward your question to our speakers for comment. And we'd also like to thank our speakers, Dr. Savanatais and Dr. Chiron, for their time to participate in this webinar. I'd also like to take a moment to thank and acknowledge um, the wonderful uh, APS team that made this happen, in particular the Pulse Committee. These team members are undergrad and graduate students, and they have put in a lot of work to make all these webinars happen. A recording of this video will be made available on the webinar homepage, to which you will be directed at the end of the presentation. Please allow for up to five days to upload. Lastly, in order to help APS continue to develop quality webinar presentations, please help us by taking a moment to complete a short survey as you exit the webinar today. This wraps up our today's event. We hope you'll join us again next time. American Physics Society, Copyright 2023, all rights reserved.